Well, first of all, uh, I really would like to um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, the Hong Kong Wetland Park to uh, inviting me uh, today and to welcome you to that lecture. I hope it's going to be very interesting, very enriching for you to learn more about uh, insects and ants in particular. So I work on ants um, for many years now and there's many things that intrigue me that uh, I'm always being more and more interested about them and discovering new aspects of their ecology, of their diversity. And um, that's some of those aspects that today I really would like to introduce to you. So why studying insects? And here you can see I put a very small caption that I probably won't need that slide if I was studying birds or pandas. It's kind of obvious for many people why we should study big things. But actually the things that really matter the most to my opinion, are the smallest one. And as you can see, I'm a relatively large individual, so saying that the small things matter is kind of paradoxical for me. But I'm going to try to convince you they're actually extremely important, and there's several reasons for that. The first one is that uh, insects have been on Earth for a very long time, about 300 million years. Ants a bit more recently, we're going to set in a few minutes. And one of the graphics here that I like the most, or one of the best figure, is this one. And so there's something very strange about that figure, I hope you can all see it well, is that there is a giant beetle, and here in the bottom left corner, you have a mite, an acari, which is also quite large. And then if I ask you to find where is the elephant on the picture, can you find the elephant? No. It's right here. It's about the size of a dot. Okay, that's the elephant. Here we have the bird, we have the plants that are also quite large. We have the rep, uh, reptiles here, and here we have amphibians with a salamander. Okay, anybody has an idea of what is actually being presented on you on that picture? Population size? No, no not exactly. Biomass? No, it's not biomass. If it was biomass, trees would actually be 99% of the picture. Number of species, diversity. So that's actually the diversity on the planet, as we know it. And of course, when we talk about diversity, so how many species you can find for any taxonomic group, insects are by far the dominant one. And we're gonna see in detail a bit more about those numbers. So one part of my work is studying distribution of species, or also known as biogeography. And as a biography, I love doing maps. So I say, well, why don't I try to depict how diverse are different groups based on maps? So here are the different colors, and I'm going to show you what they represent in a moment, actually represent different taxonomic groups. So the same insects, arachnid for spiders, mites, sexual, plants, fungi for the mushrooms, etc. Et and so what you can see is that there is a big block of light green that covers Madagascar, all of Africa, the Middle East, part of Europe, and most of Asia, at least most of the northern part of Asia. And those are insects. So if all species were having the same area that they will be basically uh, represented on a map, then insects will be covering all this part of the world, okay? Then if we look at other groups, we have other arthropods, so art, uh, organisms with articulated members, okay? So that will be like the close relative to insects, which will include arachnids, so all the spiders, all the crustaceans, the crabs, and the myriapod we will be like along Chile, pretty much. And so you see that all those together already represent like two thirds of all the species that we know on the planet. So one of the reasons you see that insects are very important and other arthropods as well is really by the phenomenal diversity that they represent. Then we have uh, other groups of invertebrates. So I'm gonna pass on some of those names here unless you are very interested into some of them, you can pick them up. We have plants that will be covering most, uh, actually all of North America and part of Central America. And then we have the vertebrate groups that I put in Europe on purpose uh, because I think countries in Europe, I'm French, are very small and I thought that was kind of funny to actually put those in small countries of Europe. Um, and so we see that they represent only 3% of the diversity on the planet. That's probably some of the group that you heard the most and that you noticed the most, except maybe for plants that are, of course, the background for most people. Um, but those groups actually very, have very low diversity relative to other groups. 
So that's one of the reasons I think it's very important when you study biodiversity like I do, to actually focus on some of the most important group in terms of diversity. This is just some of the numbers to show you the diversity of life. So one of the things that often people do not necessarily realize is that most of the life on the planet is unknown. So sometimes in the news you hear some new extra planet being uh, discovered and that's fantastic news if you like astronomy and if you like space or Star Wars or whatever interest you can have. And people are thinking we are seeking for new life on other planets. And yes, that's a very exciting adventure. But one thing that we need to realize is that actually new life to be discovered is just right here on this planet, in Hong Kong, as I will show you. And so 80% of the planet, as we est uh, 80 of the life on the planet is still unknown at that point. So before we stand spending millions and millions of or billions of dollars uh, in to space, I think we should start looking at really at what we have on our planet, because knowing only 20% at best, to me, is not satisfactory. The other important uh, aspect of insects, and in particular ants, as I will show you, is by their biomass. So how heavy are all the organisms or all the individuals of a specific group if we were to put them all together. So plants put aside, if we only look at animals then, insects again are the ones that are the most uh, important in terms of biomass. And so here it's a bit of an uh, old graphic, but show you that uh, again we have birds that are here represented by just a few percent, maybe two percent, mammals are a little bit more in this case. Uh, and then we have all insects that are all over here. So all the blue pretty much are insects. So you see that again, if you look at just the weight that in an ecosystem, in this case that was in Amazonia that people estimated that, most of the life and the weight that they represent are made by insects. Ants alone and termites represent about 30% of this animal biomass. And if we look only at insects, they represent about two thirds of life. So in this case, we have a specific groups that is known as the social insects that are the most important one. And I'm going to try to explain to you why they are so important. So who are the social insects first? Well, there's four main groups that we can um, distinguish. They are the termites, and termites include about 3,000 species. So 3,000 species, for those of you to get an idea, the entire um, mammals are about 5,000 species on the planet. Okay, so termites are a bit lower than that. They are quite an old clade, so an old group of insects, 237 million to 174 million, uh, 174 million years old. But what they are really well known for is for the giant termitaries that they are building, their nest. And so they are really like very impressive architect in that case. Because if you look, this is a human here, you can see the jeep. And so that tower made by termites is up to seven to eight meters tall. But this is only the image part of the iceberg because if you could look what's underground, you can see that here in that schematic representation, you also have most of the termites that are living within this part of the nest. And it actually go a bit more widespread underground as well. Okay, so termites are a very important group in that uh, respect. Of course, you probably all know termites because when you have them in your home, that's not a good sign because they are eating wood. But in forests, they're actually very important because they participate to all the nutrient cycling. Okay, so the vegetation will die and termites will actually break all those components, all those different nutrients, and release them again for in the organisms. So the new plants can actually get access to them uh, again. So they have a very uh, important role in ecosystem. I understand that people having them in the house are not very happy about that. Then the second group is wasp and the social wasp. So often when people think about wasp, they are thinking about this kind of wasp like this. And the social wasp are about just a, a bit above 1,000 species. But if we think about wasp in general, we can see that they are way more diverse, 110,000 species. Okay, so the social wasp are just a tiny minority of us. Most of the other ones you will probably never notice unless you come to my lab, uh, because they are very, very tiny. And most of them are so-called parasitoid. Okay, they have a way of life where they will actually lay an egg either on the body or directly within the body of another insect or another arthropod, and the larvae will actually feed on that body. If you've seen the movie Alien, you have the perfect representation of what the life cycle of a wasp is. 
Wasps are also good because they, they do different type of nests that are more like carton nests. So they will take some vegetal material, chew it, and create a carton, a paste that will solidify with uh, at the ambient air. And so you can see those very nice structures that are made of different alveola, where the, um, the wasp will actually lay the eggs and maybe so for some of them also store some of the food. Then we have the social bees, which have about 2,000 species. And again, the social bees are just a minority among the bees. Most of them are non-social, um, just so you know that. And we have some very nice ones, stingless bees, that you know. The honey bees, I'm sure that everybody uh, will know those because those are the ones producing honey. And of course, it's a very important uh, aspect um, of, of food and it has a lot of very good quality about honey. But also, honey bees, uh, as well as for many wasps, can be very important uh, pollinators. So they are very important in that regard in ecosystems. And then finally, we have ants. And so ants have um, a little bit above 15,000 species that are known at the moment. So by far, they are the most diverse group uh, of social insects. Okay? So five times higher than the, the termites, for example. And so they are dated for about 140 million years for the origin of, uh, of ants at that time. And so here you can see uh, an ant nest with one of my colleagues who is about that tall, Joan Halley. Uh, and so you can see that the nest, again, is just the emergent part that you can see. We'll see later that it is much, much larger part underground. And then we have some other social insects, um, such as some species of aphids or trips or even some beetles, coleoptera, um, that's, but it's only a tiny, tiny fraction for some of them. So I'm not going to spend much time on those. Oopla. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to pass that. Sorry, it might be too long otherwise. So just how evolution of sociality has arised. And I'm just going to stop on that slide to show you that something like parental care, for example, where you're taking care of the young uh, from the, the mother or even from the father point of view is something that is quite widespread. We often associate those kind of behavior as something like very evolved in humans or other animals. In fact, many arthropods that we tend to consider more primitive uh, express those kind of behavior. So here you can see some uh, arachnids, those are called amblypigid, are carrying the young on the back. Okay, so you can see the white parts. And you can have some spiders carrying the eggs uh, in a silk cocoon, so they actually protect them. Here we have another spider where the young actually hatch from the cocoon and they are all on the back of the mother. And even here some uh, millipedes, uh, centipedes, sorry, I, that are protecting the eggs. I actually found one just like that yesterday by pulling a stone. So you can find them in Hong Kong, it's very common. And then, sorry, I'm just going to pass again of this one to reach what we call a sociality, which is the very last step of sociality which include uh, reproductive division of labor. Sorry, I thought I removed that slide. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce you what a colony of social insect is actually made. So, this is an example with termites. And here you can see that you will have different members. We have a queen, which is right here, which is much bigger than any other termite in a colony. And the part that is especially large is actually its abdomen. Okay, so you see this is the part right here. Why the abdomen is so large? Anybody has an idea? Yes? It's carrying its babies. Yes, it's what is happening. Actually, the queen is a factory to produce eggs. So they're not yet babies, they're eggs at first. And here we can see there's some eggs, whoop, they are right here, I don't know if you can see them well. So they are very small. But in that part of the body of the termite queen, you will have thousands and thousands of eggs that will be produced. And so here are the eggs, whoops. And we have a very young worker that is right here that I also picked up on the picture, so this one is very young, you can see how small it is in comparison of the queen. And then we have a king. So one of the distinction between termites and other Hymenoptera, Hymenoptera being uh, the, uh, the ants, the bees, the social bees, and the social wasp, is that we have a queen, a king. Okay, so the male will actually stick around and be with the queen. Then we have the Hymenoptera, so here the bees, where we have workers, a queen that will be bigger, but not extremely much bigger than um, the workers, and then the males, the drones. So in this case, we don't call them queen, 
call them king, sorry, because actually the male will just mate with the female and then he will die. Okay, so it's a life of uh, male bees. And then we have ants. And here's an example of, um, maybe an example that you heard about, which is the fungus growing ant, where the queen is much, much larger than the workers. But if you pay attention, you can see that there is something particular with the workers, which are all the smaller one here, is that there is also a difference in size in the workers. So this is very important for uh, several species of ants, where the workers can have multiple size. And usually, one of the very simple classification we can make, we call them minor and major, or minor and soldier. So soldier tell you something potentially about the function that they will uh, accomplish in this. We're going to see that in detail. So. Just to show you that, don't think that necessarily all the queens are larger than the workers for ants because we have a lot of variation that we observe between different species. And here's an example. Anybody can tell me where the queens are? Yes? Is it the black ones? The black ones? Uh, no, unfortunately. The black ones here are the workers. So this is a counterexample where the queens are the smaller one, and they are so very numerous, as you can see. So sometimes the queens can be smaller than the workers. So there's a few specific cases like that. Or sometimes there is no difference between the workers and the queens, or they are not very obvious, like in this case right here. We can see some of the queens that still have their wings, so those will actually form new colonies, potentially. Okay, so one thing that is very important in ant colonies is how different individuals in the colony will actually play different roles. And so we've seen that the queen does most of the reproduction by producing a lot of eggs. Okay, the eggs will grow, become larvae, and from larvae they will uh, pupate and then become um, workers. But we also have soldiers, so that will be doing the defense. So here we have a very large soldier, and we have some very small Miners and all are those are all sisters. They all have the same parents, but they actually are very different. And they are different because when they are larvae, they are being fed differently, and they are also being manipulated differently. And that will trigger different mechanisms for them to grow as soldier or as miner. Most of the time, you will have actually a minority of larvae that will develop as war, as soldier because those are very costly to produce, and they also kind of. Um, Clumsy, if I can say. So they, can, they are also very limited in what type of tasks that they can do. The wo tiny workers, they can do many, many things, like take care of the young, they can build the nest, they can uh, forage for food, protect the colonies. Those will basically be only good at one thing, which would be protect the colonies. Okay, so they are soldiers. Here's another example with some army ants, where the soldiers have very long, um, like razor, sharp type of mandibles, and so those will be very good actually at cutting all kinds of prey or any um, opponents that might try and actually attack the colony. Here's another one of a soldier, another example. Can anybody can guess why the soldier has a very flat head like that? What does it remind you of? Yes? Uh, it's for attack. For attack? Attacking. No. Like a ram? Yeah, more questions? More answer? A shield. A shield. A shield? Yes. Ah. One. <laughs> a shield. Yes. So, it's not because I'm French, but I think about a cork. Okay, like closing a bottle. And actually, those soldiers will have a very specific function, which is to close the nest entrance. Like a cork will come and close a bottle, or like a shield could come and maybe close the entrance of, I don't know what. <laughs> and so here you can see that the soldier actually with this flat head will come and close exactly the nest entrance, the gallery of the, of the ants. Now the interesting part is that you can wonder how that ant, which is the regular worker, which also has some kind of a flat head, but not as flat and as round as this one, can go in when the other one is um, basically closing the door. Well, when you want to visit maybe friends, family, or you forgot your keys at home, how do you go in? You knock the door. 
Well, you're right. This is exactly what that ant will actually be doing. So it's going to use its antennae to actually like kind of touch with a specific pattern the head of the soldier. And the soldier will actually move back, open the gate, and the workers will come in. And then we close again. So that's a very good way to prevent any other ants or any other enemies that might try to invade and attack the nest. Then we have other workers that are used for food storage. And here are some examples. So you can see the, the ant, the head is right here. We have the, the rest of the body, the thorax. And then we have a very large distended ab abdomen, kind of a very f big belly. So those actually are some kind of a fridge ant, if I had to call them today for a specific uh, name. So those ants will actually live in desert. And deserts are very specific because, as you know from desert, they are very difficult type of environment to live in. But sometimes it can also rain in desert. And when that happens, you have an explosion of life. If you've seen some documentaries, you might know that when you have some rain in the Atacama Desert, which is one of the driest deserts of the world, or in Australia, or in the Sahara, then you have a lot of flowers like blooming just in a few days and lots of life that pop up from almost nowhere. We don't know. So the food is available in very large quantity, but for a very short period of time. And so the way you can actually deal with this kind of environment is that if you have a way to actually store your food for the period of time where actually you don't have food to eat, in the same way that maybe you might have a freezer or a fridge because you don't have to go every day to shop for food. You just want to go back home, open it, and take something. So those ants will do exactly the same role. They will store the food when food is very abundant and kind of regurgitate it to their other nest mate to provide it during the time actually when the food is very scarce. So this is very ingenious in a, in a way. Then we have other ants that uh, are much larger, sorry, because uh, by being large, they can transport more food. So they're kind of cargo. If you think about the road when you have uh, a lot of things to carry, well, you put that in a truck, not in a small car. This is in the same way uh, the large soldiers or large workers can be used for that purpose. Okay, so then the thing that is very interesting about social insects, and we saw it already with termites, is the type of nest that they will be building. That's really like what we call here in biology the social phenotype. The phenotype is just any behavior or any morphological trait that is obvious when uh, we can study an organism. When it's an individual organism, we can study only this. But when you have social organism, then you can have very complex social structure. And this is one of my colleague here, Walter Schinkel from Florida who actually has had an idea at some point. Say, so why do I try to cast some ant nest? And then I, I will dig them up and see how they look like. And so this is an ant nest here that is represented of that species, Pogonomyx badius. And so that nest was built by f about 5,000 workers in four to five days. That man is about one meter 80. You see, it's, it's not a small construction to do. But the ants actually did that. And so you had 20 grams of ants that move about 20 kilo of sand in that case. It's a huge construction just in a very short period of time. You can imagine that if you have only one nest, that's actually not so much. But in those part of the world, and like here in Hong Kong, you will have thousands and thousands of nests per hectare. So they can move a lot of soil. They can actually help really for the aeration of the soil with all the oxygen that might go through all those tunnels and potentially be accessible to organisms that live in the soil as well. One thing that is interesting is that different species will present different structural pattern. And so this one, you can see you have a few main galleries with some kind of a spatula-like type of chambers. Okay, everybody see that? If we look at other species, you will see that you will have very different type of pattern in the nest. So each of them are some kind of different species that they are building the nest differently. So you can study that and see that actually they keep reproducing the same kind of patterns even in different environments. Here are some other ones. Some are by the fire ant here that you might have heard from Hong Kong. We have some here. Uh, those actually not nest from Hong Kong, but the structure is probably very similar. So it's a very interconnected series of galleries, like very dense, kind of um, a little bit um, uh, messy, if I can say. Now we have the fungus growing hand, which we do not have in this part of the world. They're actually restricted to Central and South America. 
And so here you can see the, the top of the nest with a few cows that are actually on top. And you can see the nest is actually quite, quite large just by looking at the cows. But people had the idea one time to dig one of those nests and to cast the nest. And so the way they did it is that they took a big truck that was full of cement, of concrete, and they say, okay, let's pour all the cement we can in the nest. And they did that, and they finished the first truck. And the nest was still drinking all the cement they were putting in. So they said, well, we need a second truck. So they had a second truck coming, and they emptied the second truck again. And by about half of the third truck, finally, they fill up completely the nest. When they start digging, at that point, they knew that they had a lot of digging to do. But they found this kind of structure, like a very large structure made by only one colony that goes as deep as seven meters down the ground and that is full of uh, galleries, very large galleries, you can see here, and a lot of very large uh, kind of balloon-shaped chambers. Okay, So those are about that, sh that size here, so very large um, chambers. So I'm just going to talk about, about this group of ants because they are, they are truly phenomenal. It's not a very diverse group. There's about 200 species, uh, again, all in, in Central and, North and South America. But they have developed agriculture for about 50 million years, so way, way before humans even existed. And the way they do that is actually by cultivating a fungus. So they don't cultivate a plant. Their agriculture is made on a fungus. And so what they will be doing is that they will be cutting whoop, leaves. So some workers are specialized to cut the leaves. And so they will, you can see them if you go to Central or South America, you can see them and they will cut the leaves. Others will wait for the leaves to fall off from the trees and actually pick them up and carry them and bring them back all to the nest. In the nest, other workers much smaller will cut the leaves in smaller pieces. And the white part that you can see on that picture are the reproductive part, uh, sorry, are the, the part of the fungus. So the fungus will actually colonize those leaves and start digesting the leaves, so feeding directly on the leaves. And then they will bring their brood on it and the brood will feed directly on some of the reproductive parts uh, of the fungus. And finally, the queen uh, will also be very happy having a very large nest um, in this type of structure. So those ants are truly phenomenal because they can reach very, very large colonies for some of the species. Several millions of workers can live in a colony. Uh, and they can defoliate a very large area. Like in a night, they can completely defoliate a tree that might be like 45 to 50 meter tall. So uh, it's a huge um, amount of leaf being bring back to the nest every single night. Okay, so now how we explain the ecological success of ants and social insects. So first of all, many of them are predators. They are not just farmers. We've seen some that were uh, having fungus. Most species will be predators. So when you see an ant, um, it's not just going for your picnic, uh, but often what it does, it will actually try to capture all kinds of other insects. So here we have some army ants carrying a cockroach. So some of you might be happy to know that. They will hit some cockroach. Uh, here's a picture I, I found of an ant actually attacking an hermit crab. So they are really fierce predators. They attack even prey items that are like thousands of times or hundreds of times in this case uh, larger than them. Here we have one capturing a wasp. And here are an army of uh, acrobat ants actually attacking a spider. Okay? So they will really attack all kinds of insects. Herbivorous, other predators, or not just insects actually, but also some crustacean uh, or some um, spider arachnids. They're also very good at cleaning. So there is an ant that is carrying something. And on this next picture, I show you actually how, what it's carrying. So this is the skin of a spider. So spiders, you know, have to molt if they want to grow. And the skin is left behind. So that ant was actually just like cleaning what he could find uh, of the leftover of a spider to eat some, some of the uh, part of it. But so what you can see also is that ants are very strong. They can carry weight that may be like sometimes um, several dozens of times uh, heavier than their own weight. And so they will be cleaning pretty much everything. If there is some um, dead mammals or dead birds, they will also contribute.
to clean um, this, uh, this kind of carrion. They're not the only insects doing that. There's a lot of beetles doing that. There's a lot of diptera that are very important. And if you think in terms of diseases, that's a very important role because that actually prevents diseases to spread to uh, other parts of the population of other birds or other mammals that could be infected. Oops. Okay, so this time I'm going to talk more about plants. Any people who love plants here? I like plants. They are very in interesting. But I love them even more when they start interacting with ants. So I have a little bit of a role playing for you. Imagine that you are a plant. Okay, just take a minute, you are a plant, everybody. Oh, we are plant. Try to capture all the sun, uh, the sun rays to actually do photosynthesis. Okay, that's very important. And you do that with your leaves. One of the problems that you have is that all the plants around you are trying to do the same thing. And if the, plants, if the plant beside you actually grow faster than you, then it might actually shade, pro project some shade on you and you have less sun. And if you have less sun rays, you have less photosynthesis. So that's not very good. So you can invest all your resources if you want to grow and grow fast. But then there's a problem with that because if all your resources go for growth, which obviously I did, then you have a problem because you can be attacked. You are more vulnerable against herbivores, and in particular, insects that can attack you. So the plants to actually protect themselves against herbivores will produce secondary compounds, so molecules that will be acting almost like insecticide that we produce, to make it very simple. So the problem is that there is a cost you can produce more defense, but there is a cost of that. Or you can grow very fast, but there is a cost also of that because you're more vulnerable. So this is kind of the dilemma that you have to deal with. Well, some ants, actually, some plants, sorry, uh, have actually found an alternative to that, how they can have very fast growth with also protection. And that's by hiring a bodyguard. Okay, so you can have a big bodyguard. Oops, here's my bodyguard. And so that's very interesting. I can have one bodyguard. Maybe my wife loves to have me as a bodyguard. I'm tall, I'm a big guy, so okay, nobody will take care of her. The problem is that if you're a big tree, having only one bodyguard is not very efficient because your bodyguard might be at somewhere on the plant, but at the same time, you might have like other herbivores all over other branches that might be attacking the plant. So the best solution is not to have one bodyguard, but to have thousands of bodyguard. Whoops, and here are my thousands of bodyguards. And so, of course, I'm talking about ants here. And so this is one of the bodyguard of some plants. So those examples are actually from uh, Central America, but we have some in Hong Kong as well. And so the plants will produce something, which are domatia. Basically, they are just like hollow stem. Okay, so they just produce some, some branches, if you will, very short branches. They're a bit modified, but they are hollow. So the ants can actually nest in there. So the bodyguard will be hosted directly. Sometimes the plants go even further than that and produce some food. So it can be for sugar or in this case uh, that we call the Bayesian bodies, they might have some proteins. So there's a bit of a cost. But there is a big advantage is that the ants will actually protect the plants very efficiently against all herbivores. And so here are some examples with the Cecropia plant, which is, uh, you can see the nest of ants is right here. And the ants are all over the leaves in this example. So you see all the ants are that. In the underside of the leaf, they are waiting there. And as soon as you have an insect that lands on the plant, the, actually the ants will just jump on it and grab him directly. And even if the insect is thousands of times larger, they will collect it. In the case of that moth, that individual didn't have any time to lay eggs that will maybe hatch as caterpillar and hit the leaves later. Because that plant was very well protected against um, herbivores by ants. They are also very strong. They can actually uh, support uh, a lot uh, of weight. And so you can see here that the researcher who did that experiment was from Europe because those are euros. Um, and it's also helping, helped by the plant. The plant will have specific structure that will use like, uh, that will be uh, acting like Velcro. And so the ants plus the specific structure of the plants will actually help to um, catch the, the prey that will be coming. Ants do not just do that, sometimes they go even further where they build traps. So that's another example where you have the stem of the plant and that structure that is um, 
being magnified here, you can see that it's some kind of a tunnel-like. So you can see it over there. And there's plenty of little holes. So those ants are very small, but they are also pretty smart, if I can say. Because they will build that tunnel-like structure that they will be waiting for. And when an insect comes in, they just come and from nowhere grab the legs and pull the insect on against the tunnel and then start eating directly on the, um, on the insect. So it's very efficient. And so they develop traps, which can seem quite uh, advanced. But the story goes even further. So this is an example in Africa, where you have this structure where the ants will actually be nesting in. And it also very helpful to re repel larger herbivores, and in this case, elephants. So people have conducted studies where they actually figure out that ants, even if they are very small, can actually even repel the largest herbivores, like elephants. And how that happen? Well, that's pretty simple. If you have like a fire ant colony, try to put your hand in there. You will see how long you last. Not long. Well, imagine now that colony is right on the tree. And an elephant that comes and we try to hit the leaves will be attacked. And you say, well, but elephant skin is pretty thick. Yes, but he has eyes, he has nose, he has like ears, and the ants are just coming all over. And once you start doing that, you can imagine the elephant just go crazy and just run away. So those plants are actually very well protected against all kinds of herbivores. And they are pretty small here, here are they. So one of the examples I really like is actually one that we found right here in Hong Kong, the weaver hand, Ocophila. So this is a very interesting example because that's um, a group of insects, a species of ants that people have been using for a very long time in agriculture. Before they had pesticide and insecticide, and even now people keep using them. They were actually using, using ants to protect the orchid trees because those ants can actually be this move around between different trees, and I will show you why in a minute, but they're also very aggressive. So they will attack any other insect that will come on the plant. And so here they are attacking different groups of insects and they are communicating with each other, which is very good. So the way they are, so they are territorial, aggressive, and have very good communication, which is perfect for those kind of ants. And so here's a nest, and the nest basically is composed of multiple leaves that are being tied all together. And what's interesting, if you pay attention, is that you have some kind of a white structure right here. Anybody knows how that white structure is made? Because it's, it's really like linking the leaves all together. Okay, well, I will tell you the story, so don't worry. Okay, so first of all, the ants will actually create some kind of bridges using their own bodies to actually connect one leaf to another. Once they have reached the two leaves, they will start pulling the leaves closer to one another. Of course, they will not stay like that forever. It will not be suitable for anybody, not even for ants. So what they will do, oh, here we can see they start bring, bringing the leaves all together. What they will do is that some of the workers will actually go back to an old nest and bring the larvae. And the larvae produce silk, okay? And they will use that silk to actually tie the leaves all together. So we, they will do movement back and forth to actually tie the leaves together until the silk is strong enough to actually hold the leaves all together, okay? So, I have to say, weaver ants are not afraid of child labor. Uh, that's actually how they survive and that how they are so good. One other important ecological role of, uh, of ants in nature that uh, often people don't realize is uh, how they are very important for seed dispersal. So many plants uh, around the world are, have the seeds being dispersed by ants. And here's an example of a seed. And there's one very simple way where you can say that is because often when you see those seeds, they have something very specific, which is that yellow part here, which is called an eleosome. And that part is actually full of lipid. It has no role in germination. The only role of that part is to attract the ants. Can, can you see what kind of advantage a plant might have to be dispersed by ants? What the ants might be able to provide? What kind of benefit? Again, if you're a plant, okay, let's think about we're a plant, and you want your seeds to be dispersed. What's, what are the main advantages of that? Yeah. 
Nobody, just an idea? Well, distance. Maybe you want to be dispersed far away, so you're not in competition with the tree that actually, the, the mother tree. Okay, so that we want. Then there's predation. So a lot of other animals might not be dispersing the seeds, they might just eating them and killing the seeds. Okay, so that's, that's a big cost. Ants will actually protect them against that because they will carry the seeds underground, under the nest, uh, sorry, in their nest. So the seeds will be protected. And as I show you, once you're in an ant nest, it's a pretty safe place because ants are pretty aggressive to defend the nest. So if anything tries to the ants will be attacking. So for the seed, it's the best place. The other thing that is great for the plants, actually the two other things that are great. One is that the ants will not just bring seeds, but bring a lot of other like insects or other piece of uh, vegetables or everything. So basically the ants will create a substrate that will be like almost full of nutrients that when the plant will start germinating will be available right away. So that's a very big advantage for, for the seed. And then the last one, in many ecosystems, if you pay attention to the background, it's kind of a sandy soil. This actually take, this picture was taken in Australia, which are very diverse in terms of plants, but also very dry and have frequent fire. If you're on a ground surface for a seed and the fire comes, then you have a very high mortality among the seeds. I mean, they don't resist the plant. But just if you go a few centimeters down underground, then the temperature that you get during the fire is not high enough a few centimeters underground for the seeds to have any mortality. Okay, so you have many, many advantages like that for the, uh, for the seeds. Okay, the mandibles. So here I show you a panel of um, different ants and with a lot of different uh, mandible size. So that, that's a very interesting uh, aspect as well. So here's an example I really like, which is a species called Tomato Myrmex atrox, and you can see the mandibles are very bizarre. They're almost like a fork-like. And so for a long time, people start collecting that ant that is quite rare, and they were wondering, why that ant has mandible just like that? What could it be for? And at some point, somebody again made an observation. That ant is actually eating those kind of very small millipedes, okay? And if you pay attention, you see they have plenty of airs all around their body. Those are urticary airs. They have some kind of poison on them. So if any ants try to hit them, they will be completely like unglued in some way by hairs, and actually the ants will actually die very quickly. But that ant right here will actually be able to capture the prey, and on the legs they have an organ, or actually a structure, it's not an organ, sorry, which is almost like a comb. And so while the ant is actually grabbing the, the millipede, it's gonna shave it. It's gonna shave it entirely until it has no hair left, and then it's gonna hit the prey. But not only it does that, but it will also use the hairs after to make like a defensive barrier around their nest entrance. So they will use the defense of the prey to the, for their own defense. This is pretty, pretty crazy, you know, when you find those kind of things, that, wow, that's, that's cool. The trapjaw ant, another example, we can find some here in Hong Kong. This is the fasten, fastest animal movement recorded in the entire world, 230 kilometers per hour. The anterior closure movement is about 13 millimeters, uh, 0.1 millisecond. So here you can see a trapjaw end, the mandibles are wide open, and you can see there is some small hair that are uh, kind of projecting forward. And when the end comes in contact with the prey, the ants will snap their mandible, and it's so fast that even if the prey is not, is out of reach, the, the wave that the movement will create is enough to knock out the prey. Yeah, so that's, again, that's a pretty impressive one. So here, this uh, small crickets actually is not as long to leave. And here, this one was captured already. Oops, sorry, I, uh, I can probably show you the video. Um, how am I on time? Is that okay? A bit too long? Okay. Okay, so here you see some of them. So it's some slow motion. So this is some of my colleagues from the US. And here's the wall closure. Can see? The sound is added. 
Just expand the head. So the head is very large because it's full of muscle. It's, the brain is very, very small. It's ridiculously small. So it creates a very large impact for anything. So here's very slow motion. Okay, now there is another way that the ants actually are using the trap jaw system. It's for escape. So they use it for predation, but they also use it to escape their own predators. And the way they do that is by placing the head against the, the substrate and snapping. And you see that the ant is projecting. measured it, as you can see in a very scientific and high technology method with a ruler. Okay, so I'm just going to stop that here because it's just a repetition after. So when I, when I collect nest of those species of the genus Odotomachus, it's, it's actually pretty scary. Because what you hear, you hear plenty of snaps all around. And one thing I should tell you is that those ants have also, also have a pretty bad stinger. Their venom is pretty painful. And so you know that when you hear a snap, you know they are jumping all over you. But you never know where they're going to land. And they can land on your leg, they can land beside you, on your neck, you, you don't know. And so it's quite a stressful heaven because things can happen at any time and you can have nests like with thousands of individuals in there. So believe me, that's not the best one. Uh, very interesting to study though. Okay, so for my part of my research uh, is we try to understand the diversity pattern of, of ants and insects more generally. And I try to do that at, at the local scale, so that's part of the work I, I will be doing and I'm doing in Hong Kong, for example, and some at the global scale. And so some of the uh, important aspects that uh, I want to understand is how uh, the global changes, so that include anything from deforestation, urbanization, biological invasion, even uh, climate change, can actually impact um, ant diversity and distribution, and how, at the very end, it will affect ecosystem. I'm also interested into the ecology and evolution of ants over time, like how they have been changing their diversity pattern, how they diversify. Some uh, specific group have been uh, um, diversifying very quick or other being extinct. And doing taxonomy, so describing new species. So to understand how ants uh, were globally distributed, I developed uh, with some of my colleagues from uh, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology uh, a tool that is called AntMap.org. So it's available online. If you're curious, you can just go on it. You can go right now. Um, and so the tool uh, will actually allow you to look at any place in the world and see what ants are being present. And so the warmer gets a color, so the darker and red it gets, the more ants you will find. And so at this point on, um, we know that the most diverse place in the entire world is in Queensland in Australia, where nearly um, 1,500 species have been recorded. So it's a huge amount of species. Now you might wonder, how, what about Hong Kong? Well, we can zoom in. Hong Kong is not accessible directly, and we can go in Hong Kong. So we can look at Hong Kong right here. Whoops. And we have 171 ant being recorded in Hong Kong. So does not include actually um, the recent records that we had in Hong Kong and not published yet. Uh, actually, at this point, we are about 290 species. So we had a lot of species in Hong Kong. So we start doing work here. Um, we can also compare just in the nearby region, so Guangdong. So Guangdong is a bit more. It's larger. There's maybe a bit more work. Taiwan as well. So anyway, and then you can click on it and have a list of species that are being found. So this is more for the, the specialist, of course. But if some of you, I'm sure some of you, are, after leaving that room, will want to know more and do taxonomy and identifying ants, you can use that tool uh, if you want. So I also do taxonomy, which is, uh, to me, very important, uh, which is describing new species. 
Um, so here are a few examples that we did, uh, that actually I did, so this one was from Yunnan, uh, very rare genus that we, we discovered. That was the, the second time that that genus was uh, collected ever, and that was a new species. Here, those are two species that we recently described, actually this year, from Singapore. I uh, don't think I only described yellow ants. Uh, I also do some, some uh, black one. So this one again was described from Singapore. This is one that um, we ha are describ describing from um, Henan province in China. And so I just want to ask you, so can you guess how we named that ant? Because we can choose the name. That, that's a great thing when you do taxonomy. You can choose the name of what you want. So if you look at the head, how will you name that, that ant? Any proposition? It's too late, I'm sorry, I'm not going to change it, but... <laughs> yes? No, 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 sorry, sorry. Uh, is it... You, you name it by their bodies or their ah. speciality? Uh, yes, we can do that. We can do that, you're, you're right. Uh, often people don't. Now people try to be a bit more creative as well. Just say, well, you know, if I want to dedicate the, an ant after, let's say, my, my wife or my friend or, or somebody I really respect or something that... Me, think. But this one, we actually, we, we thought there was something very specific about the head. It reminds us, I, I will give you a hint, remind us of a specific cartoon character. Anybody has an idea? Okay, I'll sh show you a picture. <laughs> Do you recognize him? The Joker in Batman. Okay. So, kind of, kind of scary eyes like that, like kind of hypnotizing and like the big... Uh, smile. So we, we named it Leptogenis. That's the name of a genus. That's invariant. We cannot change it. But jokery. Okay? So like the joker. We, and we had to Latinize the, the name as well. So, you know, sometimes you can have fun just by describing new species uh, as well. Not just... Um, and th this one we call it magnificent because if we thought it was just a very elegant and, and beautiful ant. Okay, so the ants of Hong Kong, and I think I'm going to be assisted here to pass some of the, the pictures. Um, you can look at them more in detail. So the ants of Hong Kong. So I arrived in Hong Kong a bit less than two years ago now. And, um, and I was very eager to work here because uh, not so much work was done. Most of it was created by one of my colleagues, John Fellows, in the 90s, early 90s. And I thought there's probably a lot of work to be done. And uh, well, so far, I turned out that I was right. Um, and so there's a very important diversity of ants in Hong Kong. Um, and actually, one of the problems in Asia uh, is that there's very few places that have been very well sampled. And I hope, and we're really working very hard for that, that Hong Kong will become one of the epicenter for diversity of ants in Hong Kong, because it will be one of the main uh, reference collections that people could use, not just for Hong Kong, but for Guangdong, for Macau, for Taiwan, for uh, other places all around. So that's some of the work we are trying to do here. And we have some very um, amazing species. So here is a species called Arpignatus venator. I'm sorry, um, ants do not have common names. So we always use the Latin name. It's just the way it is. Uh, 15,000 names is just too difficult to memorize. Um, and so that, that ant is, is very incredible because, first of all, it can jump. Not in the same way that a trap jaw ant, as you already can really jump using its legs. Um, but they have those uh, amazing mandibles that are very long, you can see, and are kind of curved. Okay, so they, again, they're using that to collect like uh, some insects. I don't know exactly which insect actually they are collecting. But you can see they also have very large eyes. And what it's telling us is that it's an ant that actually will use vision to orientate itself in the environment, but also to uh, approach and catch the insects they will be collecting. One that I really like is the foamy ant, which actually turned out to be the larger ant in Hong Kong. It's about 1.5 centimeters. And we call it foamy ant because when it's actually being attacked, uh, it produces foam. It's, it's real foam. Uh, you can see the bubbles. Here, a fantastic picture from Alex Wall, one of my colleagues. So you can see all the bubbles that are being produced. And uh, don't try to grab it with your with your hands, because it has a pretty bad stinger, so don't, don't try that. But if you have tweezers, you can try. It's a really large extent, and I promise you it will do that. Yes? Is the end poisonous? Is the hand? Poisonous. Poisonous. Ah, uh, no. 
they, ha they can be um, venomous, but they are not poisonous. Everybody knows the distinction between poisonous and venomous? How? Is a snake venomous or poisonous? Snakes, uh, some, of, some of them, not all, but like a cobra, for example, is that a venomous snake or a poisonous snake? How do we say that? It's a venomous snake, okay? Because they actually inject a toxin directly. And so in the case of snakes, through actually uh, the teeth. For the ants, they will do it through the stinger. Poisonous will be the case of some frogs, for example, that if you hit them, then you have poison that is coming. So if you eat those ants, they are not poisonous, but if they sting you, then they are venomous. Okay, so those ants are venomous, they're not poisonous. Just quick distinction here. So that ant, actually, you can, um, you can see them in, in Hong Kong. They are very common. I, I collected a few yesterday. I don't think I brought any with me today. Um, but they are very interesting to produce that foam. So now one of the questions that we have is, why do they produce foam? Yes? Because I need to shave, maybe? <laughs> because if any enemy attack him, he could use the foam and let the enemy to can't see him and he escape quietly. That's exactly that. You, you, can, you can come here and give the rest of the talk. That's, that's exactly that. <laughs> yes, so, so the, 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 worst, the worst enemies, let, let me give you a few more details. The worst enemy of ants are other ants. Okay, they eat each other all the time. And in particular, the one that we call army ants. Okay, army ants are kind of, you can imagine like uh, barbarian raiders, just like attacking any other colony of ants that they can find out. Those ants, they are very large individually, but they have very small nest, 30 individuals maximum. If you're large, like me, I can maybe like take a smaller one easily, like, oh, I can push you. But if I have 100 or 1,000 attacking me at the same time, I promise, I will be overwhelmed very quickly. This is what is happening with those ants. And the army ants, contrary to the, the, that ant or the Arpegnatus we saw earlier with large eyes, the army ants are blind. They only rely on pheromonal communication, so chemical communication to direct themselves. There's some properties that that foam would do. is actually going to create like almost um, a shield, a chemical shield, where the pheromones will be completely um, lost in the process within the, within the foam. So when you have a nest where you have a gallery of that very large ant and you fill it with foam, it's almost like you fill it with some kind of a chemical barrier that the army ants cannot go through. So they will hit that barrier and they will just keep going like away. Okay, so even if they are large ants that you can think they can protect themselves pretty well against other ones, you can be overwhelmed very easily if you have more workers. And in the case of that ants in their nest, they can actually block like this, uh, this nest, the entrance, by producing foam. So it's very, very efficient. More recently, I also observed one of those ants that was kind of, um, we, we put baits to attract ants, and one of them came. But it came late. There was another species, a genus called Feidole, that had like hundreds of workers exploding the piece of, of a sausage we actually give them. And that ant came and started spreading foam all over. So it was very, very surprising. But the result was so efficient that just a few minutes later, all the individuals of the smaller species, Feidole, were completely gone. They were completely panicked. They all escaped. And that ant, had all the sausage for itself. So it was actually very, very efficient. Um, okay, much to learn about Hong Kong hens. So those are a few species that we discovered. Uh, this one, actually I found it was I was teaching uh, insect ecology in a, um, in a oh, typo car. And I just found, in, found an ant. So, oh, I don't think I've seen that ant yet in Hong Kong. So I collected it. It, not, it was uh, a new record. It's called Polyrachis rufipes. It's a very nice species with a lot of uh, defense. So those are called propodial spines. And it's probably a role in defense against uh, predators, especially birds and reptiles. 
And that ant was, that's the distribution has, how we knew distribution of that ant. So I use ant map, my own tool, as quite efficient. And you can see that the closest record that we have were from Yunnan in China. So we have kind of a, a very large, uh, a quite good, sorry, extension of range of that species. Those are a few uh, small trap jaw ants, actually the larger treasure ants. We have some smaller ones, so we found a few new species record. Some are new species that we uh, will be working on for actually describing them and giving them new names uh, as well. Here again are some uh, species we found. So I really like those because they look like teddy bears. Uh, tiny, tiny, tiny bears. Um, but one thing that's very interesting is in their behavior, they are actually specialized to feed on spider eggs. Okay, so they will feed only exclusively on spider eggs. And if you look at their body here, it's kind of curved. The tip of the abdomen is curved. And this is where they will actually place the egg, right here. So they will catch the egg and put it like that and feed on the eggs directly. So they don't have ends like us. So they are kind of difficult to grab something spheric, something round. But they will use their body and their, mod their body is modified to actually uh, have the egg uh, like that. Yes? Oh, so thank you. So a new species record is a species that is already described but not found yet in Hong Kong. Okay? A new species is a species that has never been described by anybody. So it's a species we don't know. It's new for science. Okay? And so then we can describe it eventually. It takes some time and, uh, to do that, but we can. Here again, those are the Dracula ants. Okay? Anyone know because why we call them Dracula? Yes? <laughs> Maybe they drink blood. They drink blood. They do. They do drink blood. Um, they don't drink all blood. They drink the blood of their own larvae. So for insects, blood is actually called hemolymph. That's the term. Um, but they will actually drink the blood of their own larvae. It's like, oh, that's kind of strange. Well, it turned out that for the larvae, it's a problem at all. They, they survive and they have no problem finishing their development. What those ants will do with their mandibles, you can see they are very long and with some teeth, and they will actually pierce the, the tegument, okay? So the skin of the larvae, and you will have a little bit of blood coming out, and they will actually suck up those juices. So that's why we call them Dracula ants, because they drink blood. Um, I never tried to use onions on them, but I think they're not running away. Okay, here are some army ants. So I told you some army ants are kind of those barbarian uh, invading different areas. So those, they, they really like move all together. You can have thousands of them uh, moving all together. And so we have a few new species for Hong Kong, so new species record, uh, and also some new species potentially to be described. We found some new genera, so that's level above um, above species, just to give you um, an idea. Imagine that you know that you had um, cats being present in Hong Kong, but you don't know you have genera, like different genera, like tigers. And so forth. like, oh, cool, funny, we distinguish like tigers being present. So that's quite uh, interesting. We have a few of them. Here are some of them. And then we even have new subfamilies, so it's suddenly you you know all the mammals of Hong Kong, but you never know that bats were in Hong Kong. And so you discover that you have bats were at the ant level. That's kind of, uh, kind of a new discovery for us as well. So a lot, a lot of things that were discovered. Um, the latest one is actually just three days ago. My PhD student, uh, Roger Holly, actually has discovered uh, Catolacus, which is a new generic record for Hong Kong. So that's okay. one more genus, and of course, one more species. We didn't identify it yet. So that, in this case, that's a queen. Okay, so just to give you um, what we are planning to do a bit in the future, um, well, we're going to keep looking at the diversity of ants and other insects. Um, my laboratory is working on imaging all the species for Hong Kong and also uh, further, like in Guangdong and other part of Henan where we do work. And so this to make a website so everybody could go and admire how beautiful or how diverse uh, ants are in Hong Kong. And we're going to keep updating it as we find new species. Um, we try really to encourage species discovery uh, and of biodiversity census in Hong Kong and other parts of Asia. This is very, very important for us to do. And now is the time because, as you probably all know, uh, deforestation in particular is a huge, huge issue. So if we don't do that now, we might be losing a lot of biodiversity without having any records of that. So at least if we have records, we can, it's still time 
somehow to do uh, some actions. And so we invite people to participate if you want to communicate about ants that you collect. Um, but we also have a program which is called Name an Ant. So you can support our research financially uh, and we'll name a species after you, whatever name you want, as long as it's correct. We have a few rules. Uh, I don't want anything offending. Uh, but that's, that's a program if you are interested uh, in doing that. So I'd like to thank you, and thanks again the Hong Kong Wetland Park and Hevelin for inviting me. I uh, hope you enjoy learning about ants.